The Indian markets have seen some great runs in uh, recent times. How will it be in the run-up to 2047? Will there be twists? Will there be turns? Will there be nasty surprises or joyous moments? And will the growth of these markets be in tandem with the growth of the Indian economy and vice versa? Let's put the spotlight on all of this. Once again, a very, very warm welcome, Mr. Shankar Sharma and Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya. I hand this over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Geetika. Uh, this is the last session of the first day. Um, and uh, we kept the markets uh, at the last day, the last session of the day for deliberate reasons, uh, because we felt that uh, getting your worldview on Indian markets uh, would be uh, good food for thought as we go home. Um, uh, uh, and thank you once again for agreeing to come all the way to Delhi. You are normally a regular feature for our BFSI summit. Yes, correct. And they are uh, always uh, sort of an In exciting Mumbai. thing. Yes. Uh, let me, let me s uh, start uh, uh, the session uh, with this question uh, that... Uh, Can I start with one question to you, Akib? Sure, please, okay. go ahead. Why has Mr. Nainan stopped writing the column? Uh, this is... Uh, this is uh, is he there uh, in the audience? Uh, well, he was there. He was here, yeah. Probably he anticipated your question. Okay, and he left so before that. He <laughs> left, yeah. Uh, uh, he, he decided not to write the column. Uh, this has been an issue. Uh, he has been wanting to stop writing the column for quite some time. Uh, business standard would not let him go. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a loss for us and loss for all our readers. Absolutely. Uh, no, no doubt. For sure. Uh, I will convey... Uh, Please do that. Please do that. Again. Even once a month would be yeah. great. I mean, yeah. if I can understand a yeah. weekly yeah. column pressure. Yeah. yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but he does write for Business Standard. You may have seen his. We 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 reproduced his his lecture on on reimagining Indian agriculture from an employment perspective. Right. Yeah. We, we published that, and it it, it 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 was once again well received. Okay. Uh, great. So but please do you. convey my question. Sure, I will. I will. Great. I will. Thank you. Uh, 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 let me uh, say that. Uh, uh, how do you see the the stock market uh, to perform or fare uh, in the next few weeks, uh, or let's say in the in the month of uh, June and July? You know what I am referring to. Yes, of course. Uh, you have the elections and all right, fine. Then you have the results on 4th of June. Yes. So if I were to ask you, and you, you can enlighten us, that how should the those who have uh, an interest in the Indian economy and in the stock market, and uh, those who are investors, how should they uh, look at this June-July period, and what should be their, their approach, as well as how do they analyze the market? And can you give us your insight into the markets, the way they will pan out, uh, particularly in June and July, in different scenarios. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> so first and foremost, uh, AKB, the key question to remember, or the key point to remember in markets is that, uh, I might sound a little rude, but markets are not faithful bedfellows. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> markets, if uh, if any of us were that promiscuous, we would be labeled as being absolutely the worst of humanity. Mm -hmm. Markets don't really care who runs the country. Let me be absolutely clear about it. And there is plenty of data to back up whatever I am saying. But the data that we can hark back to is the return of the UPA in 2009. That's right. When in 2004, when they came first to power, the markets fell dramatically 10% because it was with the left government and there was concerns that the left would uh, disenlistment jai bhandme yeah bhandme exactly that's <laughs> what i think <laughs> uh, uh, ab bardhan statement ab bardhan statement correct exactly so all that caused a panic but it was very temporary and we had fantastic next 4 5 years of returns up until the uh, yeah. the great financial crisis and then <clears throat> We had the Mumbai terrorist attacks in 2009. We were right. hand, we were grappling with the aftermath of the 2008 great, December. Yes, correct. Yeah. And uh, and in 2008 we had the great financial crisis. We had Satyam. We had the terrorist attacks. I mean, 2008 was 
was a terrible time and everybody is predicting doom and gloom for the present yeah. government of the day. And when they came back with a near majority, I mean, on, without the left and all that, not, not, not obviously the full majority, the markets, I think, rallied 20% on that day. Mm -hmm. And then within two years, the markets wanted them out. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm trying to make is that markets don't really care. Markets only care about the numbers. Markets care about growth. Earnings. It, earnings. It could be me running the country, you running the country, or anybody running the country as long as the numbers come through. Uh, markets are fine. So, the, to answer your question, I think the markets are anticipating a comfortable ride uh, to the to the victory gates for the government of the day. To my mind, if that were to happen, nothing much will happen to the stock markets. Oh, because that's already that's anticipated. Already in. That's already priced in. That's already baked in. And I don't think 20 seats here or there. Of course, if it dips below the 280, then of course we have another problem or the 272 mark. But assuming it is higher than that, and it is higher by 20 or 30 seats or whatever it is, I don't think it will matter to the markets. Markets are good pricing mechanisms, mm -hmm. and it has priced in that situation. So the only thing that can happen on the, is can only on the negative and not on the positive. Mm -hmm. So the markets are priced for a victory of the current uh, dispensation. Should that uh, you know, actually come out to be true, I don't think you can see much upheaval on that narrow front. Mm -hmm. But there can be problems on other fronts. Okay. But if you have a question on that, I'll answer that, or I can answer that prior to your question. Well, uh, uh, you can, uh, and you should, uh, but let me add to this. Uh, you know, there is a sense that why is it that 2024, to many, look quite similar to 2004, in terms of, you know, everything is going fine, India is shining. Ah, you mean, okay, interesting question. Uh, uh, everything is doing everything. You know, I mean, you, you know, growth is happening, money is flowing in, uh, India is on top of the charts. Uh, and 2004, something similar was happening. Can you, can you open this? Yes. 2004, something similar was happening. And a lot of people wonder that 2004, mm. mein, how will markets bake that in? Like I said, if that were to happen, yeah, I'll be ready with the with the cash to buy. I can guarantee you that much. Because you believe that the India growth story will uh, exactly that is the core point that I that I said that markets are beyond a certain party and a certain leader, and we can all have political views and political leanings. There is no harm in that. We are a democratic country. We should have points of views on who's right for the country. But in my view, what is right for the country is that the person should be literate and mm -hmm. the person should not be totally corrupt. Some corruption the country can tolerate. Other than that, okay. the India's itself organic growth story is unstoppable, in my view, for literally decades to come. And that's simply because 150 crore population earning $2,000 per capita has no other way to go except up. We are literally, even today on a per capita basis, lower than many African countries. Mm -hmm. With a country as vibrant as India, you can, it doesn't take an economist of any measure to predict that this will become $4,000 or $6,000 or $8,000 per capita. It does not matter who's running the country as long as, like I said, you know, they are not the worst. Mm -hmm. As long as an averagely good man runs the country and a good party runs the country, I think we are good. So therefore, my point is, if what you said in the 2004 situation happens in 2024. No, I'm just asking, you know, I mean. Look, you are right. <laughs> we should not be so sanguine about the fate of a movie, the fate of, a, of an election, and the fate of the stock markets. Yeah. Because each time we become so sanguine, the markets, and all these three phenomena have a way, way of surprising us on the opposite, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, but if that were to happen, I think that will be the buying opportunity of the decade. Okay. And in any case, you feel that uh, stock markets are uh, in many ways beyond the pale of electoral fortunes. In a sense, if a party loses, party gains, as long as the economy is intact, growth opportunities are there, earnings are fine, uh, stock market will, in I a mean, country like India, will in keep In 2007, doing which was with a, with a UPA, which was a very uh, uh, you know, weaker UPA than the 2009 UPA, 
I think in 2007, we did 10% GDP growth mm -hmm. with roughly a half percent fiscal deficit. That's right. I mean... Till 2008. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Till the yeah. crisis. If yeah. the crisis had not happened, maybe we would have done equally well right throughout. Yeah. Number two point, even in the United Front government years, 97-98, the economy grew 8% yeah, and 8.5%. Yeah. That's right. I mean, that was as fractured a polity as you could ever imagine. We had so many prime ministerial changes, and yet we grew 8.5%, 8.5%. And then emerging out of the 2008 crisis, okay, we had one bad year, which every country had, but in the next three years, we were way ahead from the rest of the pack. Mm -hmm. So again, the point is that, uh, and of, of course, we now know the data of, of this government, the first six years were very tepid, but the last four years have been on steroids. So my point is we cannot draw conclusions on which party is right for the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yeah. is, I think, a spurious yeah, yeah, correlation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so my, my point is this. The problems, as I was mentioning, might be different. And the problems for the equity markets can be simply that we have had four very good years. And no bull market that I know of lasts beyond five years. So... Okay, because I wrote an article for another paper recently and basically I said even while I was writing it, it occurred to me that why is it that we have a bull as the animal depicting an upward trend and not a horse? Oh. Yeah, because a horse can run vast distances without pausing. Yeah. But a bull is not physiologically, physically built to run for long periods of time at high speeds. It, has, it can charge. So it can sprint. So how long can it last? That's it. So the data is very clear. Again, data can be, I mean, the data, I mean, everything is a probability. I'm telling you what is the most probable outcome. It could be that it may not come true, correct? Sure. That's okay. Sure. But we have to we should still look at the data. The data is that no bull market really lasts beyond five years. It tires. Now we are seeing the wobbles in the year four. We are now just yeah. as we speak today, entering the fifth year. Yeah. COVID was the low of March twenty of March twenty twenty. March twenty third yeah. was the low, yeah. to be precise, on the date, and we just crossed it. So now yeah. we are in the fifth year of this bull market. Bull markets in fifth years become very very tricky. They become very moody. They become very, you know, uh, not predictable. This bull is already acting a tad unpredictable. You are making a and headline I, point on this. Yeah, and, and I think that is people are wondering, is it because of the SEBI crackdown on, or SEBI comment on small caps or ED crackdown on some some people from Dubai who had invested in companies. Or the I'm RBI say, crackdown or on the KTM RBI crackdown on NBFC. I'm mm -hmm. saying these problems in a young bull market would have been shrugged off by that bull. These problems for an aging bull market start to draw blood. Uh, that's an interesting point. That's the point I'm making. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, a, a related point, and I will come to this uh, aging bull market phenomenon. Uh, you know, everybody talks about uh, uh, $10 trillion economy, uh, $5 trillion economy, um, per capita income will go up to $15,000. But nobody says by 2047, what will be the Sensex or Nifty like? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious to know. Aren't people uh, tracking that sector and saying that somebody says 100,000, but nobody talks about 2047 as census. Kitna well, I mean, if you take a look at uh, just the market cap to GDP ratio, you predict the GDP and you say that we are trading at that market cap. Yeah. So I don't know what it's the... It's more than the GDP right now. It's slightly higher than yeah. that. Yes, exactly. I, yeah. I agree, and which is another danger signal yeah. to be to come yeah. back to the danger points. Mm -hmm. But if you take one twenty percent or hundred percent or something, we, I don't know what numbers okay. are being predicted. Yeah. If it is forty trillion, what is the number being predicted for forty-seven? Uh, well, GDP. Uh, everybody is talking about thirty trillion or something like so that. So thirty, thirty-five trillion. So if you take a one point two ratio to that, if you're talking forty trillion, but the point of these forecasts is that you should make the forecast so far out. That you may not be even around to de to to defend them in case That's they are wrong. Epic. That is the that is the <laughs> way forecast should also, be no? made. <laughs> so I am willing to make this forecast. Although I I'm definitely going to be around. But mm. I mean you know to it's right. it's yeah. a bit too far out to make these these kinds of predictions. Okay. okay, but let's come back to the the aging bull market thing. Yes. Uh, how would you see the the current uh, doubts questions 
uh, on both the mid cap segments and the small cap segments. Everybody yeah. says there is froth. Somebody says, oh, the small cap is worse than the mid cap. Mid cap may abhi bhi jaan hai. Uh, I mean, how do you, uh, from, a, uh, from a stock market expert's point of view, look at both the mid cap and the small cap? And what is their uh, lifespan? Uh, what is their longevity going to be like? Yeah, that's a good question. But let me answer in another way. Yeah. Let me give you some broad data. 2014 May, now that we are entering the election season, let's compare the data for the last 10 years. 2014 May till 2024 March, or assume it is May for a minute to make the 10 years complete. The Sensex or the Nifty have given us 12% CAGR. For which period? 10 years. 10 years. 10 year period. By the way, the longer term forecast and the longer term data is 15.5%. So actually, in the last 10 years, the Sensex or the Nifty mm. has delivered 3% point less than on per year basis, which is a lot on a, on a compounded basis, correct? Mm. Mm. Less than its long-term trend. That itself is a very telling data. And uh -huh. I don't know why people don't talk about it or it's inconvenient to talk about it. But I'm talking about it right now because I guess that's why you called me. Yeah, right? absolutely. That we want to talk a few uncomfortable yeah. things yes. also. Yeah. Uh, so we have actually delivered less on the big companies than we have delivered on the small companies. And that raises one question that are big companies too big to keep growing at the rates we have seen in the past. If you look at aggregate profits of corporate India, hmm. it's 120, 130 billion dollars, whatever, 3, 4% of GDP. Yeah. Can it potentially increase so much that this market cap itself doubles? I think there is a big question mark on that for large companies, mm -hmm. but not so for small companies. And I've been a proponent of the small company argument for precisely the same reason that I do not see large companies having the headroom for additional growth in India. They will grow at normalized rates. And their bigger problem is that nominal GDP growth is not supportive of large mm -hmm. company growth. If your nominal GDP growth is 10, 11, 12 percent, yeah. we have a problem on the growth for corporate top line as well as bottom line because they will necessarily mirror what is nominal GDP growth. So I would actually request the government to get nominal GDP growth, I think there is talk about it, yeah. to 15, 16 percent because then we are talking a different number. But small caps don't care about nominal GDP growth. They are, they are immune to economic cycles because they are so small they can grow irrespective of the fluctuations of headline GDP numbers. I still do believe India is a small cap market. But, okay. yeah, big time. And I'll tell you one simple reason why. When I entered the stock market in 1989, 1990, the total GDP of India was $200 billion. Yes. Today, I think we add around $200 billion to GDP every year, approximately. That's right, yeah. Correct? Or maybe even more than yeah, that. Yeah. What that means is that at a $4 trillion economy, growing, adding $200, $250 billion in incremental output every year, and you divide this four trillion by five zones, you get an average of eight hundred billion dollars on the average. Mm. I know there is like yeah. the regional sure, sure. Uh, the disparities. I'm just drawing a yeah. simplified average: yeah. eight hundred billion dollars per region. Mm. Okay, that is equal to the GDP of Saudi Arabia. Mm. Yeah. Each region today, or actually more than the GDP of Turkey. Yeah. Now, collection of North India, I mean, a bunch of states, is equal to the economy of decent size European economies, mm -hmm. okay? So now what that has done is that a small company just addressing its own neck of woods, let's say even servicing West Bengal and Urissa and the Seven Sisters can do numbers. And I know companies, we do profits of 100 crores, mm. not on venturing a, out of a, Calcutta. On a top line of? On a top line of 500 crores. Oh, that's fine. I mean, it's fantastic. Snack food companies, jewelry companies, shoe, shoe wear companies, white good company, I mean, white good retail companies selling only in Bihar. I mean, I, I'm shocked when I meet the promoter. He says, boss, there is, there is flying off the shelves in, in states like Bihar. I don't even have to go to West Bengal. Mm. So w my theory on India has been last three, four years that now each part is equal to one country. Companies don't have to be pan India to get growth. Because a West Bengal company will be able to penetrate West Bengal be better than a Nestle can if you're doing snack food or a Titan can if you're doing jewelry. Yeah. They understand the local market. They can be low cost. Mm. That's the story in India. It's a bunch of regional companies, which means smaller companies, and they can be much more nimble, agile as so compared to... So you are essentially saying that uh, the, the bull run 
is not aging as far as the small cap is concerned. Exactly. So isn't that a, I mean, isn't that a contrary to It's the not contradictory. What will happen is that we... In the market that, oh, small cap may problem hai, don't get into it. So I always say small caps are, ex they are like the mafia. It's easy to enter and impossible to exit. <laughs> so, 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 and, and the other thing I always say is that the small cap train is the only train you should jump off when it is going at high speed. Okay. Because when it's slowing, you, can, you should not jump off. Sure then you'll actually off. get killed. There yeah, is no exit. Yeah. There is no exit. So I always say this, as a matter of systematic investing, please take some money off the table in small caps. Doesn't mean you should sit, sit on cash. Nobody can. Nobody should. And they will be far more volatile. There will be promoter quality doubt. There will be balance sheet problems. Yeah, there will yeah. be all kinds of problems. But still the game remains that. Okay. It's a tough game. Yeah. But that's the only game in town where you can get seriously rich. I do not think large caps will make you seriously rich. They can probably prevent you from becoming seriously poor. Mm -hmm. Now that's yeah. a different point, point altogether. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. we are entering the market not to not become poor, but to become rich. Yeah. Wh wh what's your take on the mid-cap segment? Now mid-cap is neither here nor there. Now there, there are decent companies in the, let's say 5,000 crore to maybe 20, 25,000, which is yeah. more or less the mid-cap range. They're, 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 they're decent companies. But my view is that if you are an investor which whose land a lot of young people have come in, they are there to become seriously wealthy, hmm. not just hmm. to compound wealth at 12%. Okay. There you will necessarily have to buy a bunch of these assortment of companies, which is 50 crore, 100 crore, 200 crore, 500 crore, 1000 crore market caps. And out of that, unless you're an absolute idiot, you should be able to get five fantastic companies. Mm -hmm. You will not get 50 fantastic companies. But okay. those five will more than make up for the pop or the sins we'll commit in the balance 40, 45. Okay. That's the way, it's a game of probability. Okay. That's the okay. way I look at it. So what you're saying is uh, that uh, large cap uh, has uh, the risks of uh, aging, bull run. I aging. mean, the numbers are telling you, AKB. Yeah. Uh, mid cap, uh, neither here nor there. It is a small cap, which is the story of the future. Absolutely, because India is a because collection way, of large markets. It is a connection of large markets. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's sh uh, sort of shift gears a bit. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, whenever you talk about investing, we only talk about, uh, you know, equity markets. Yes. But there are many other markets. Of course. Also doing very well. You have got gold, you've got real estate, uh, you've got debt. Um, uh, what will be your forecast for gold, real estate, and debt? going forward in our journey to... So first I must say this, that Indian investors, I'm not talking investors in stock equity market, but Indian investors overall, their pie chart of investing has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean the primary uh, uh, vehicle of investing has been real estate followed by gold or might be a different proportion depending on which segment you're talking about and then bank fixed deposits. That to my mind should remain the fundamental bedrock of any Average, I'm a professional, I can be 100% equity. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, that's for me. That's not relevant yeah. for large parts of the population. I would not recommend that you should have, anybody should have more than, uh, at the highest 30% exposure to equities. Beyond that, you're then becoming a professional and do you have the tools and the mindset to become one? Please evaluate that. Even so, less is So okay. what is this big thing about 60-40 ratio, depending on your age, if you are 60, this should be the share, you know. Is, so, is look, we are all in the you business. You are saying something different. I'm saying completely different. So, I don't agree with that, although it's a well-marketed theory. Yeah. See, understand this. Our industry is fantastic at marketing. Not all the marketing need be true. Okay. okay. But it can be true long enough for people to start believing that this is the ultimate truth. But all I know is that it's not the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is that third equity should not be more than 30%. 30%. Even, even if your overall returns come down as a result. It ultimately, it's about risk-adjusted returns. Okay. You know, if I'll give you one example, AKB. Hmm. Equities have returned us in the last 10 years 12%. Okay. Annual volatility is maybe around 12 or 15%. Okay? So your sharp ratio of equity returns is 0.9. Okay. Okay? Bank FD, I think most throughout my life and even today, have yielded anything between 8 to 12%. Okay. Take an average rate of 9% with almost zero volatility. Okay. But there is a tax element there. 
So tax is because that's a certainty here. The, you don't even know whether it's a certainty or not. <laughs> Please understand this. It is not that you're, it's your birthright to get 12% return, correct? Yeah, yeah, sure. So with that, I'm saying your sharp ratio on a bank fixed deposit is literally 9 because wall is 0 or let's say it is less than 2%. Versus that, you have equity with at 0.9. Look at the differential in risk-adjusted return between a bank FD hmm. and an equity asset. So I'm saying by all means play equity, but with very calibrated exposure. Please don't start buying the hype that my industry puts out continuously on television and media. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, what you're saying is probably proven by the overall behavior of the Indians. You know, I mean, with a with a uh, three million. Uh, investors in the market or around that? So uh, people talk about 8 crore investor, yeah. 10 crore, but that's even with one share you are counted yeah, as an yeah. investor. I think the, I don't know the data, but the skewness must be very, very high. Very high. Very high. So in a country of 140 crore Maybe 50 people, like people? 50 like people. Mm -hmm. 50 like maybe a crore at the highest. So so they, they are listening to you then? They are. And I hope and I pray that they continue listening. Big people in my industry always talk about that equity ownership is 4-5% or of total yeah. financial assets. And, I s and US is 70%, UK is 80%. I say, please, let's not even go there. Because their exposure to equity markets determines the wealth effect. Okay. If the equity markets go down, literally high street sales come down. Of right. goods. I don't want my country to be exposed so much to the vagaries of the equity high highs and lows. So if equity is 30, what will be the rest, 70%? Oh, okay. So real estate is illiquid. Obviously, okay. you cannot yeah. put more than, and it sure. should be only used for your personal use. I don't yeah. believe yeah. real estate is an investment. Land works, but apartments and houses don't necessarily make, make you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So that may not be more than 5-10%. The rest is basically gold given the currency that we are blessed with. I mean, gold <laughs> necessarily gives you in terms of the hedge against the currency depreciation mm -hmm. year after mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. So I think, and it's liquid, it's it's like supremely you know uh, and, and, and the store of value continues to remain through generations that's right and if you look at central banks buying up gold that itself is telling you how much they value it that's right so gold gold to my mind between gold and fd you split the 50 50% okay fd is good in my view and fixed income beyond fds is also good i mean in a bajaj finance i think you can get maybe 9 and 10% in That's certain right. maturities. I mean, Bajaj is the best industrial group in the country by far. They're not going to go bust. So with 9-10%, why should you, why should you even capital? waste your time thinking equity should be 50%? Okay, okay. Yeah. So I know it's not going to be this talk. If it gets out there, it's not going to make me very popular with my no, you know, I mean, compatriots. But it is what it is. It's a, is a point of view. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, in this, any discussion on, on stocks and uh, the financial markets, uh, the elephant in the room in these days is technology. In a sense uh, that uh, what role will technology, and particularly AI, and we had a lovely session in the morning uh, on AI, uh, how will AI and the advent of technology at this rapid pace uh, will play out? And how do you see the technology sector? Uh, is, is it a sector uh, that is worth looking at? And how should one approach it? How will technology sector, technology will, will impact your stock markets? And how will you, how should one look at the entire phenomena the symbiotic relationship between technology and the stocks? So, I mean, in my opinion, and I'm a firm believer in AI for equity investing, or for that matter, any kind of investing. Mm -hmm. Our funds run on that basis. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, we are working on a product to make for the average investor on the street using AI yeah. to literally level the playing field between the sophisticated institutional investors and small investors. I mean, this is going to be the future. I think active managers or the human beings in the management, the fund management industry, they really need to be watching out for their seats. It is going to transform industry after industry, and our industry is the most easily transformed industry. Mm. There is no reason why a machine cannot do a better job of picking stocks than human beings can. There is no reason, absolutely none. And it is reshaping, if you talk about technology sector or the IT services mm. sector, I think there is a problem that they have, without yeah. any doubt that our B IT majors face a fairly uncertain future on that front. Yeah, yeah. So I think both things combined, 
look change is there how we exploit it is ultimately rather than fighting it i am all there to exploit change this change i am exploiting as an investor most people will and indians are good at tech in general yeah. they will mm-hmm. adapt and adopt it quickly for the technology majors they will they will need to figure out a new new act for sure okay okay now uh, my final question before you go to the the audience for their questions uh, we are running out of time now just 10 minutes left uh, i know it's a it's a slightly uh, tricky question uh, what is you think what is going right or what is going wrong for the regulators as far as stock markets are concerned you mean sebi or I, I, or, or rbi both or both 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 play a role yes and in, in, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. stock markets so in my view as far as sebi is concerned on the stock market i think uh, the chairperson voiced her concerns on the on the froth here mm. and then of course sebi has been very active we have seen cases you know of That's corporate right. fraud being yeah. unearthed and all that you know large media company i mean i don't want to comment because i think all everybody has a defense and they will be putting it out in the appropriate legal fora i think they are doing a perfectly good job on the warning about the market i think it was high time hmm. it was about time i know on social so media timely, yeah. social media it was highly criticized because apparently she punctured the equity uh, bull market but i don't believe that is uh, nobody can okay. puncture anything mm-hmm. she said the right thing a regulator has to uh, uh, caution people and i can tell you this akb that i have seen in the last one year or maybe two years people who cannot tell the difference between a pnl and a balance sheet become fairly yeah. wealthy yeah and i worry about these things <laughs> i'm in fact jealous about them yes because here we are sitting and wasting time with martin wolf and you know uh, yeah. liberal democracy and interest rates and all that these these guys don't even know the ignorance is bliss in wpi and cpi yeah. yeah yeah and they are laughing all the way to the bank that's right and they jeer at me the shankar bhai you work too hard we don't need to work so hard to make money <laughs> so when i see all this yeah i worry i worry a lot yeah. about these things so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she did the right thing by pointing out a potential problem as far as rbi is concerned i mean th- i mean i have a lot of respect for them mm-hmm. whatever they are saying and i know also from other sources that it's not unfounded or baseless these are serious things but it also points out one thing that our fintech industry or the lending industry has also gone haywire in the last 2 3 years yeah. with a lot of laxity in the credit quality and the credit appraisals but that's a different discussion i think both of them are doing a perfectly good job but i have another question for you sure okay, but whatever has happened on the on the fintech regulation and the stock market regulation has happened for the good i have 100% i have no disagreement okay. whatsoever sure you what's your yeah, question my question is this and not a, not not a question it's a, it's it's a thought yeah. that we have now 10 years of this government the first 6 years were very tepid in terms of economic growth you know that you know yeah. the data it was 4% or some the last data print was before covid was just i think 4% or yeah. so 3.9 3.9 exactly right mm-hmm. in the last 4 years we've had obviously covid and then a big crash in gdp a shooting of the fiscal deficit and now a relative normalization of the fiscal deficit but it's a new new normal in which we are projecting to come down to 4 and a half back in the day going up to 4 and a half would have crashed the stock market crashed the bond market hmm. but how easily we have adjusted to a 4 and a half bahut acha lagta hai because optically it is less than the 6 and the 7s which we have gotten used to in the last 2 or 3 years my point is and my concern and my question is that has driven capex that in turn has driven equity markets yeah both are not sustainable situations as we all know the government cannot spend so much cannot run deficits of this kind once they normalize this even to four and a half let alone to the good old days of two and a half or three when we considered that in pranav das yeah. th- or even one more since then you know that even three was considered high then what happens to equity markets is the question which d- requires some debate not here but that's sure i know i think you have made a very valid observation the, all that i can say in response is that uh, in the last uh, in the post covid uh, the the world scenario has changed uh, you know industrial policy is back globalization is something of a word that is not really looked at uh, in the same way as it would be in, in the 1990s yes uh, the world has changed the fiscal deficit as a concept itself is no longer 
as brahminical a concept as it used to be but should it not be uh, well, now the us uh, has 130% no, debt to gdp I, I, in, in all fairness what the government has done it is 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 is, uh, is relaxed its pace of fiscal consolidation to pump in that extra money through capex and my sense is and i'm only uh, giving you my assessment sure, sure. is that there will be uh, instruments coming going forward the next 5 years probably on the consumption side but without that you you the the engine of the, the economy will not just move on on only on investment exactly it has right. to have consumption exactly right so so therefore uh, so far the government has very assuredly stayed away from giving any direct uh, you know Im impetus, impetus to, con to consumption to consumption uh, i mean stayed away from in terms of tax incentive or tax yeah, yeah, yeah. this thing so uh, my sense is that time will come when the government alone cannot just go in for investment it has to go in for clearly measures to uh, but i am not the finance minister so <laughs> <laughs> so any questions from the floor uh, please go ahead yeah identify yourself uh, Hello. Yeah. My question is to Shankar. Yeah. Uh, you said it should be a 30% cap on your equity investments. 20 to 30%. Yeah, 30%. Yes. You got me really worried because I am almost 80% in equities. How uh, much are you? 80%. Okay. And I am looking to get my you know morning bread for the next 20, 25 years as long as I live. Maybe e uh, occasional evening uh, scotch. Uh, uh, but uh, in in the fixed instruments, you barely beat inflation. So how do you, uh, what do you, what do you suggest one should do? I mean, if I go 70% uh, in debt, I would barely be where I am maybe 20 years from now because inflation gonna eat uh, most of my returns in uh, debt. And by the way, Bajaj gives you 8%, not 99.5%. No, they do, I, I actually checked by the way. I was looking yeah. to put some money into it. I think Shiran Transport gives 9.5, which is the maximum. But anyway, you- Anyway, it doesn't matter, yeah. yeah. And also, uh, how uh, do you think it is uh, all right for us to invest in NASDAQ in the U.S. Uh, stock market? Because there also you have the currency play. Yeah. So yeah. So the question really is that return uh, on capital is what you're talking about, which you are guaranteed in case of fixed inst uh, investment. Uh, not guaranteed, but more or less, like if you're in good credit. Uh, so return on capital is guaranteed, but in equities return of capital itself is not guaranteed forget about return on capital it's not guaranteed nobody can guarantee you that and you can have large periods of suboptimal returns which we conveniently forget because we have something called a recency bias last four years have been fantastic for equity markets and that is telling us that that has always been the case but the data that i am pointing out is that from 2014 till 2020 the equity returns were a pathetic 9% per year, okay, which is in India f for taking that risk is not adequate compensation. So let's not get swayed by the returns of the last four years. Take a 10 year view, you're getting 12% compounded in equities versus an 8, 9% without volatility in fixed income. Understand this point. Now, if you're an expert investor, which is what I said, then you can live with a much higher one. I don't know how much time, energy, effort you spend in it. If you're a professional, you know, I'm a professional, I have virtually 80, 90% in equities. Because that's, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, that's my job. But for most people, I'm giving a generalized point of view. It can vary depending on how adept you are at the game. That's all I can say. Yeah, the equity exposure you say is your direct equity exposure or you also include PMS and mutual funds in that? I mean, again, it depends on how much time and effort and learning you're willing to invest, invest for. Most people, indirect investing is much better. Direct routes are obviously going to be much more challenging. Yes. If you're willing to spend the time, do a bit of direct, but my, my recommendation, again, for the average person is don't even think about it. To answer the last question you mentioned about investing overseas, you must always do that because you get the dollar hedge for sure, but also you get diversification, and that is critical in all of this. Your 80% is not diversified. Now, you could become very wealthy 25 years from now. I'm not ruling it out. But you would have taken a huge amount of mental turmoil, strain in getting to becoming very, very wealthy. If you are prepared for that, go with 80%. If uh, there aren't any, any, any questions from the floor, uh, we would 
uh, we would like to sum it up. Uh, Shankar, thank you. There is one question. Please go ahead. Investment in gold. What, what exactly is your question? Uh, I'd like you to elaborate uh, about the investment in gold that you uh, spoke about. So gold is literally a hedge against the dollar rupee you know, exchange rate. And you know, if nothing else, it will mirror this. But sometimes it does even better than that. And by and large, if you look at the long term returns from gold, it has fairly low volatility and a steady upward you know, climb in part because of our own currency depreciating almost continuously. So, you know, I think for Indians who are used to having less volatility, because we have a lot of volatility in our daily lives. See, equity is good if, you're, if your life is very well settled. I always say this. It should be an outcome of how well settled you are in your own life, so that you can take risk. Western democracies, well settled, you know, good income, you know, you have good visibility of life. In India, we are not there yet. So let's not go into so much risk in our personal investing as we are enduring in our professional lives. So there, gold as well as fixed deposits play a very, very crucial role. They are not going to make you millionaires and billionaires. Forget about it. But they will stop well short of becoming of making you a pauper, which equity markets can. Don't ever forget that, please. Suppose you have got 100%, like 80% of your money put into equity. What should be the safest mode of putting your money in the percentage of large cap, mid cap, and small cap to again, take the hedging of uh, this? Again, the same cap. thing. Large caps won't make you a lot of money, but they won't obviously make you a pauper. So it's all about risk and return. So you know, if you're happy with a 8 10% annual return, which I don't think more than that is possible on a long-term basis on large cap, you know, have 40, 50 percent there within equity itself. And small caps should be, you know, 30 to 30 to 50 percent, so small and mid. Mid might be 10 or 15 percent, but small caps are where you'll make a lot of money, but also a lot of, you can lose more hair than probably what you've lost already. Yeah. Okay, I think we have come to the end of this wonderful session. Uh, if I can, um, Try to sum it up, uh, Shankar, with your permission. Uh, I think what you are saying is don't excessively worry about the election results. Uh, they uh, may be this way or that way, but the stock markets will find its own uh, um, you know, mo movement and velocity. Number two uh, is uh, the bull run that you have seen so far is aging, so beware of it. Number three, that uh, if you are uh, a person who is not, uh, who does not have the energy and the, and, the, and the mind space to focus on what kind of investment you want to make, uh, is better to be, uh, to limit your exposure to equity and rather go in for gold and FD. And finally, uh, the regulators are doing a good job. Uh, so that's the summary of, of the day. Thank you very much once again. Please give him a very good hand for this. Thank you very much for your presence and your advice and your insights. Please come together for a group photograph. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our esteemed panelists, please. <laughs>